Welcome. I'd like to welcome you all to the Life Futures Roundtable. I'd like to start by saying that perhaps no other event in recent history has had a greater impact on our ways of life and sociability than the COVID-19 pandemic. Alongside a terrifying death toll and a radical exposure of the precarity of our existence in the face of a lethal virus, we have seen our cities and urban ecologies transformed. Empty streets and squares, curfews and the disarticulation of public spaces. The pandemic has also impacted the organization of labor. New forms of remote work, the blurring of our workday's temporality, the intertwining of leisure and workspaces, the weight of gendered care and reproductive labor becoming even more unfairly distributed, and the constrained and unequal exposure of precarious and essential workers to the risk of contagion. Well, all of that marked the past year. We have also experienced a series of political tensions, such as the one between the biopolitical and securitarian care of life on the one hand, and the full exercise of democratic rights and participation in the other. The far right and populist governments have taken a negationist and anti-scientific stance on the pandemic. While on the other, while on the other hand of the, the other end of the political spectrum, we've seen both a defense of collective care of life in face of the virus and a critique of the restrictions in place as dangerous signs of growing state authoritarianism. In this context, we would like to propose a discussion on the challenges presented by the forms that life, individual and collective has taken up during the pandemic. How and to what extent have our lives been truly transformed? What are the possibilities of change that the experience of the pandemic opens up and even makes necessary? Has any of the changes provoked by the pandemic created new spaces of possibility for political and collective action? The Life Futures Project explores these issues. In collaboration with uh, Coventry City of Culture 2021, the University of Warwick, Coventry University, and the Herbert Art Gallery and Museum in Coventry, our aim is to bring scholars, artists, and activists together and begin a public conversation on the forms of life and sociability in the context of the pandemic. Without stepping into the realm of prescription, we'd like to invite you all to undertake a critical exercise of, of imagination of future forms of life after and beyond the pandemic. Thanks, Federico. Uh, so I'm delighted to welcome you all and our wonderful speakers uh, that I will now briefly introduce before asking them to make their brief opening statements. Miguel de Bestegui um, is research professor of philosophy at the, the University Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona. He specializes in 20th century German and French philosophy, but in the past decade has been working to resist, to resist philosophy's specialization and to develop the conceptual tools to engage with our present. He's the author, most recently, of The Government of Desire in 2018 and the forthcoming Thought Under Threat on Superstition, Spite and Stupidity, both with the University of Chicago Press. We will then hear from Chiara Bottici, who is a professor of philosophy and co-director of gender and sexuality studies at the New School for Social Research in New York City. She has written on critical theory, the history of European philosophy, capitalism, feminism, racism, post and decolonial studies, and aesthetics. She's the author of A Philosophy of Political Myth in 2007, and two forthcoming books, among others, A Feminist Mythology and Anarcha-Feminism, both with Bloomsbury. Our third speaker today is Maurice Steele, who is currently a Leverhulme Early Career Fellow at the University of Warwick, and from September 2021, he will be lecturer in international relations at the University of Sheffield. His research focuses on migration and border struggles in contemporary Europe. He's the author of Migrants Resistance in Contemporary Europe, Rutledge 2019, an editor of the journal Citizenship Studies and a member of the activist project Watch the Med Alarm Phone. Last but not least, Martina Tazzioli is lecturer in politics and technology at, Gold, at Goldsmiths, University of London. Her work at the crossroad of political theory, migration and border studies 
and political geography explores the biopolitical mechanisms by which some subjects are racialized and governed as migrants. She is part of the editorial collective of radical philosophy and a member of the Euro African Migra Europe. She, she is the author, most recently, of The Making of Migration for Sage in 2019. So, once again, welcome everyone, and I will invite Miguel uh, to take the floor for his statement. Thank you. Thank you, Daniele. Thank you, Federico and uh, Karolina. Um, I would simply like to say a few things, um, mainly that I'm struck by the extent to which the COVID-19 crisis has uh, amplified, magnified, intensified phenomena we already knew about and uh, forms of life we already experienced before the pandemic. The COVID-19 crisis uh, crystallized and exacerbated crisis of a different kind. Let me mention just three very briefly, which I believe are intimately related. To begin with, the pandemic highlighted the increasing and accelerated transformation of our lives, our bodies, our sense of space and time as a result of the technological, information-driven virtual world we live in. For those who possess a computer and a good internet connection, let's call it the hyper-connected class, the pandemic has brought everything closer, virtually and infinitely closer. At the same time, many of us felt this longing for another kind of closeness, a more physical embodied closeness, which we tend to take for granted by virtue of being able to see touch and even smell one another. We realize how vital uh, this phenomenological body, this incarnate self is, how vital it is to cultivate embodied practices, whether at the intimate, personal level or at the social and specifically artistic level. However, and this is a transition to my second point, this experience of virtual existence and heightened embodiment was also determined, if not over-determined, by the nature and size of the space we had to live in and share. For some, the phenomenological experience was that of a lack of and a longing for the necessary and necessarily subjective distance required to live together. The second point I'd like to make is that the pandemic also highlighted and strengthened inequalities, something we all know, between poor and rich countries, between social classes, between genders and sexes. Uh, I believe we will touch on the issue of the increase in domestic violence, between those who have access to medical care and those who don't, those who have rights and are free, and those who are imprisoned or detained, subjected to very high infection and or mortality rates. A recent New York Times investigation revealed that the infection rate in ICE detention centers in the US were 20 times that of the general population and five times that of the prison population. The pandemic then increased the gap between secure and precarious forms of life between those who are able to live and those who merely survive, thus reinforcing the need for greater solidarity, hospitality, equality of means and dignity. Finally, and as a way of extending my previous point, I'd like to say something about precarious forms of life that are not human, but threatened by humans, and in turn render human life more precarious. There is now sufficient evidence available to conclude that the ecological devastation, in particular the systematic deforestation and extinction of species for which human beings are responsible, makes pandemics such 
of COVID-19 more likely in the future. Whilst two thirds of insects and mammals have disappeared in the last few decades, those that managed to survive and thrive, such as rats and bats, are more likely to host potentially dangerous pathogens that can make the jump to humans. There is a strong connection between biodiversity loss, land use, and emerging infection diseases. And we should add climate change in the mix. COVID-19 also reminds us of the ecological catastrophe, if not geocide happening under our watch. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miguel. Ara, the floor is, is yours. Okay. So ever since the beginning of the pandemic, I was struck by the way in which the COVID-19 has exposed our trans individuality. What do I mean by this fact? Following people like Spinoza and Simon Don, I mean the fact that our bodies are constituted by processes of association between different bodies, not only at the inter-individual level, how two individuals interact with one another, but also at the supra and the infra-individual level. I would like to call this feast of reciprocity without boundaries, somatic communism. How does it work? Think about what happens at the supra-individual level. We have already heard from Miguel, the way in which, for instance, capital, a capitalist world system and global racial regimes prop up certain uh, individuals above others. Think about the inter-individual level, how the extraction of surplus values enables some individuals to accumulate capital at the expense of those who have no other capital than their labor force or even their bare life. Think about gender hierarchy. As the lockdown went on, gender violence skyrocketed, showing what we already knew. Homes are only safe for the first sex. Now, up to here, one may say, fine, okay, we already knew these things existed. What is new? What I think is new is how the pandemic also exposed how our bodies depend on infra uh, individual bodies. So not simply uh, interactions, but also infra action. Uh, examples, uh, obviously, the, the COVID-19, which a zo zoonotic virus that links our fate, not only to the fate of other individuals, individual beings, but also to the fate of other animals. If they are sick, we are also sick, uh, as well as the more than human, because the virus itself is a category that question the traditional boundaries. Think about the molecules we breathe, how we all suddenly during the pandemic became aware of the air we are breathing, whether it may be carrying infectious disease or not, whether we do have enough air to breathe or not. Now, the molecules we breathe and literally become constitutive of our body, as well as the food we eat that literally becomes constitutive of our body, makes us dependent not simply on other animals, but also on plants, as well as oceans that stock up carbon dioxide. This infra-individual level, in particular, in my view, questions what is one of the bedrock of Western metaphysics, uh, the distinction between life and non-life. Most Western ontologies are indeed bio-ontologies, being philosophies that measure different forms of life by the quality of one forms of existence. Whether it is bios, the qualified biological life, or zoe, the bare life, it is always life that is the lens through which we look at non-life. Deprived of any interesting place within them, stones became the epitome of dead matter, as if such a thing could ever exist, just as Stone Age 
is concomitantly projected as the epitome of barbarism. The notion of Gionto power, which I borrowed from Elizabeth Covinelli, enable us to look at this scala nature, this idea of a scale hierarchy within nature from the end of its spectrum, the stones, dead matter. The hierarchy of man, woman, slave, animal, vegetal, inanimate life, which from Aristotle onward has been central to Western metaphysics, is indeed constructed according to what Sylvia Winter called an over-representation of man that classifies individualities accordingly to how closely they resemble the top of the scale, man with capital M. It's not by chance the most environmental philosophy philosophy, for instance, focus on animal and animal liberation with comparatively little attention paid to plants. Dogs and cats respond to our solicitations so they become more easily extension of human narcissism, whereas plants, let alone stone, exhibit a sovereign indifferent to us for which they play with their systematic neglect by philosophy. And yet, literally, plants make the world because they constitute 90% of the eukary eukaryote biomass of our planet. Now, if plants are too dissimilar from man to be given extensive and constant uh, philosophical uh, consideration, then stones and minerals or the earth itself, not as surprisingly, is barely taken into any epistemological, let alone agential consideration. Now, the idea of a scala nature uh, constructed on the hierarchy of uh, man, woman, slave, uh, pla animal, plant, and stone relies on two presuppositions. First, the hierarchy of being, the second, the methodological individualism. So the idea that uh, the world is constituted by a ready given individuality so that we can separate man from woman, from animal, and so on and so forth. But COVID-19, as in my view, deeply questioned this individualism. It has proved, uh, if there was need for it, that we have never been individuals, but we're more like lichens or what contemporary biologists call holobions. That is, symbionts constituted by bodies that are not simply inter-independent, but also and much more poignantly co-originated. Now, it's not that such a trans-individual philosophy is new. Um, a lot of philosophers already spent some time with it. It has been circulating for a while, but we can no longer ignore our trans-individual nature and thus the chains of supra, inter and infra action between different species and ecosystems the price we may pay now for such ignorance is going extinct as a consequence of global warming or the next pandemic created by a zoonotic disease. In sum, if there is one thing that the pandemic made patent to us, I think is the fact that we cannot be healthy on our own. Either we are all sick or we are all healthy. And by all, I do not simply mean humans, but I also mean the more than human, including type of animacies, the question, the life versus non-life divide. Thank you. Thank you, Chiara. Um, I would like to invite now Reese to join us. The floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, so I just want to briefly reflect on the issue of collective life during a moment of time and in a space that is, of course, not collectively shared, but deeply cut up, divided and segregated. So when the global dimensions of this pandemic became clear, you know, there were some who suggested that in one way or another, we are all in this together. That this was not the case became quickly obvious and so maybe the more critically minded highlighted the racialized class, gendered and other dimensions connected to inequalities and privileges that were both further exposed and reinforced during the pandemic. The critique then of the idea that we are all in this already together 
was then connected to an appeal, right? Namely, that we should come together despite the absence of such prior togetherness. And togetherness here would translate not, of course, into physical proximity, but also into social proximity and new forms of solidarity. And we did see some new relational practices and forms of solidarity evolve. But at the same time, as Miguel and Chiara have also said, um, you know, the last year has clearly shown the exacerbation of existing inequalities visible from within our neighbors, uh, neighborhoods to around the globe. So what I do want to focus on now is the question of the border during the pandemic, which I think raises a range of issues which, call, um, which emerge when we call for togetherness and solidarity and when we want to contemplate life futures. So I think the border is and remains a very central question of our time. I recently uh, revisited RBJ Walker's book, After the Globe Before the World, in which he writes, I quote, in my judgment, sovereignty will come to be an increasingly perplexing problem, not a condition to be confirmed as either present or absent. And political life will increasingly be articulated in relation to the boundaries, borders and limits that we have become used to treating as mere demarcations between places where politics is supposed to happen." End quote. So the invitation to focus on what happens at boundaries, borders and limits has been taken up in you know, existing scholarship. We've seen a whole array of literature that points to the multiplication and diffusion of borders and boundaries, the ways in which they emerge in different shapes and forms, crisscross the world, societies and groups of peoples and individuals themselves, right? At the same time, I fear that the pandemic will have a lasting effect in terms of reinforcing not the perplexing problem of sovereignty, but the sovereign imaginary of where politics is supposedly happening. And I think this will have serious consequences for those who are regarded as border subjects, right? Those who cannot be placed neatly into sovereign and national containers. Over the last year or so, we have become so used to seeing like the state when dealing with a pandemic. Of course, we've observed rising numbers in different measures all around the world, but usually through a state lens and state policy. So state statistics, comparisons between states, vaccine nationalism, the triumph of this or that government over COVID, uh, and so on, as well as you know, reinforced border controls as supposed safeguards to keep foreign variants out. When the pandemic started, I wrote a short piece with uh, Zandri Mezandra, where we were sort of wondering what would happen to the freedom of moving to movement during a pandemic. And we noted that the pandemic shows that a global health crisis cannot be solved through nationalistic measures, but only through international solidarity and cooperation. The virus does not respect borders. Of course, on the one hand, it remains the case that the pandemic and responses to it escape sovereign delimitations. And yet I fear that the pandemic has prompted a sort of new respect for borders as protective shields, despite the fact that they are shifting and diffusing and segregating everywhere. So there seems to be the slightly paradoxical situation where on the one hand, it becomes ever more complicated to even understand what a border is, given its heterogeneous appearances, uh, and on the other hand, we see a solidification of traditional imaginaries of borders. And for me, this is quite a dangerous blend, for it allows border violence to become both ever more diffuse, but also accepted as creating you know, these protective divisions. So we have come to see camps as protective camps, pushback operations at sea as, as protective pushbacks. And as I work a lot around the Mediterranean border, you know, over the last year, we have seen a, a really dramatic escalation of border violence that was then, however, justified uh, as a way of protecting both European societies as well as those precariously on the move from the spread of the virus. And I think Martina would uh, expand on that. And in light of all of this, there was very little public outcry, but rather acceptance that those moving without authorization from the state during a pandemic would thus need to in some ways be renationalized, if you will, you know, compared to stay within their supposed national and border containers, even if this act of compelling would require uh, also acts of violence. Um, so thanks, I will just leave it here. Thank you so much, Maurice. So before um, opening up to 
discussion and Q&A, I will invite Martina to join us for a statement. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Daniel, um, for the invitation. So um, I will kind of continue along the lines that Maurice um, just developed by focusing on the notion of protection. The notion of protection um, as a keyword that has been used, widely used during the pandemic, <clears throat> and in particular on the nexus between protection and borders. So the idea that <clears throat> uh, protection can be reached through the enforcement of borders um, and heterogeneous bordering mechanisms. So during the pandemic, the World Health Organization promoted the slogan, a virus that respects no borders, protecting migrants and refugees during COVID-19. So if on the one hand is undisputable, that is in the nature of the pandemic to spread across national frontiers. On the other, I think we can reverse the statement and ask which borders did COVID-19 generate and multiply? Protecting citizens from the global health threat through sanitary surveillance and border closure has characterized indeed public discourses and political agendas across Europe. The term protection has crisscrossed the political spectrum from the left to the right wing in COVID times, and it has been used in multiple ways, protection from the virus, protection from migrants as potential um, uh, corona spreaders and foreigners as also potential vehicles of contagion, but also protection from unsafe environment and crowded spaces. But so, of course, this question, this term protection should be uh, questioned in light of a very, like also banal uh, uh, interrogation. So who gets protected and which links between containment and protection did the pandemic reinforce? Indeed, what we observe um, during uh, the multiple lockdowns in Europe and also in the UK and across the globe is a multiplication of what we can call hybrid forms of containment that has been enforced in the name of protection. So what also uh, in a paper that we uh, recently wrote with Maurice, we define as a principle of contain to protect. So containment in the name of protection, protection of migrants, of uh, the most vulnerable, right? But also protection from them. Um, and uh, this is what, what we argue in the paper is that this represent a considerable shift also in the humanitarian security rationale. So this idea of uh, <clears throat> uh, protecting, um, uh, containing, sorry, in the name of uh, protection. In particular, the nexus between protection and borders has gained traction in the base that reproduce, I argue, binary opposition between freedom of movement on the one hand and uh, struggles um, for uh, access to health on the other, right? So this has been considered as um, two things that go one in opposition to the other. Um, of course, when I speak about uh, borders, I don't refer only to national borders, but to heterogeneous bordering mechanisms such as urban borders, local frontiers that have multiplied during the lockdown and have um, produced um, a new uh, hierarchies of mobility within the city, uh, but also social borders and hygienic borders. Um, so, and this is this very nexus between borders and protection from the virus that I suggest has been widely taken for granted and fundamentally unquestioned um, and actually op opposed to anti-lockdown positions. So questioning this nexus appears as questioning, I mean, uh, su supporting, right, anti-lockdown position, while I argue that the point is precisely to uh, get out of this binary opposition between a liberal uh, conception of freedom of movement uh, as the individual right just to, to move for those who are already at this uh, access to mobility and uh, uh, equal access to um, health and health care. So, and for me, what is striking is that the desirability of borders, right? Um, uh, we can make, trace a, make also a comparison between what Foucault says, so desir desirability of power. So are borders so desirable? So the, very, the wide acceptance and acceptability of borders that is profoundly unquestioned. So COVID-19, as I said, has been characterized by what I call a confinement continuum and continuum enforcing the name of protection. And uh, of course, the UK is an interesting uh, uh, case studies. Um, if we observe um, how actually uh, during COVID-19, mobility has never been stopped, even when uh, strict res border restriction has been implemented. Actually, during the lockdown, the multiple lockdowns, um, uh, there has been 
a, a reinforcement of a class-based mobility that in the UK is um, actualized through these uh, multiple rules of like tests to pay, right? And also uh, hotel um, quarantine. Um, so um, uh, just to conclude, I think that an insight into migration and how migrants have been governed during the pandemic is a useful lens for understanding precisely that borders didn't, uh, far from uh, protecting the most vulnerable, have exposed them to uh, the virus even more. Uh, a, a very quick snapshot, one is from the barracks in Folkestone, so these uh, are um, ex-military sites uh, uh, in the southern of England where asylum seekers, so people who claim as that want to uh, find protection in the UK are currently detained in the name of their own protection, but actually this um, barrack site has been uh, criticized for the um, hyper uh, um, overcrowded conditions that migrants experience. These barracks have been transformed into cramp spaces. And the second point is what has been going on in, in the Spanish enclave of Ceuta uh, over the last, um, in the last few days. So the migrants who, as you probably um, read in the news, um, managed to cross, 5,000 uh, migrants managed to cross to, from Morocco to Ceuta. These uh, were um, Moroc mostly Moroccan uh, citizen who before the pandemic has the authorization to go during the day to Ceuta to sell their stuff and that because of the lockdown uh, remain blocked on the other side of the border. So further restrictions have been implemented also on people who before the pandemic could travel. Um, so yeah, uh, to conclude for the discussion, I would like to raise this ambivalent use of uh, protection during the lockdown. Thank you. Thank you so much.